Hey guys I'm Yurizi. This story is all about what if Naruto turns into a fox during a full moon. Pre-timescoop, no biju, Kanaha is a village of ninjas who hunt demons. Naruto is a ninja with secrets. And tonight is the night of a full moon. Before we proceed with the story, please like and subscribe to this channel if you liked the video and don't forget to check the description for the other works of the author if you liked the story. Let's start. Chapter 16, Fox Bones and Snake Fangs Naruto's initial impression was that it was a really freaky opening to a cave. Then he saw through the layers of tree roots, vines, and moss and realized that it wasn't a cave mouth at all. It was a toothy animal skull, the size of a house, with the rest of the skeleton presumably buried in the massive tree-covered mound that rose up behind the half-buried skull. What the hell is it? Naruto squeaked, dimly noting that the creepy sensation in the air had quadrupled here. What is it? A dark voice called out from seemingly everywhere and nowhere. Why, this corpse is the source of the forest of death. Team 7 immediately fell into a defensive posture and scanned the dense trees around them for the speaker, but they saw no one. Naruto tried to subtly smell around, but he all caught was the sense of the forest trees, dead leaves, a whiff of something furry, decay, nothing human. Sasuke was using his sherry non, but he didn't seem to be able to see anything. Sakura clutched a kunai in her hands and looked very nervous. When none of them called out to the voice, the disembodied and genderless speaker called out them again. 250 years ago the man who would become the Shodai Hokage and the leader of the Uchiha clan, Madara, set out to hunt down and destroy the lord and master of all Kitsune, the Kyuubi no Yoko. They engaged the monstrous fox near the northern border of the Land of Fire with a small army of their best shinobi and battled the demon for a day and a night. Just as they were gaining the upper hand, the Kyuubi, sensing its imminent defeat, broke away and raced towards the infant leaf village with the intent of destroying it in its death throes. A dry chuckle echoed through the trees and made the genin trio shiver. The Kyuubi no Yoko very nearly succeeded. But, at this very spot, the rest of Kanaha was waiting, under the command of the Shodai's future bride. When the Kyuubi arrived, she used her unique chakra to bind the fox down for a few precious minutes. With the fox held in place, Madara incinerated it with his forbidden fire technique, and the Shodai seeded the charred corpse with his Mokuton spawned trees, burying the demon's bones. But, even though it was dead, the Kyuubi's evil still lingers. The laugh came again and Naruto jumped when he suddenly spied a figure leisurely crouching on the half-buried skull of the nine-tailed demon. The hatred of the Kyuubi seeped into the soil, the heavily robed figure almost purred. It's what makes the trees here grow so large. And, by virtue of living here, the animals are corrupted into pseudo-demons. To keep it from spreading, the Shodai's wife had the fence built around this forest and infused it with powerful seals. The mysterious person lifted so that its face could be seen underneath the shield of its broad-brimmed straw hat. It looked female, but the voice almost sounded like a man's. Naruto finally spied a Hitaiate and thought it was the symbol was of Kyuzagaku or no Sato. To think, even two and a half centuries later, the seals on the fences are still needed to keep the Kyubia's evil at bay, the Kusanin remarked, apparently to herself, himself. The power of the Kitsune is truly something. The Kusanin glanced down at them, as if really noticing them for the first time. I'm surprised, the aura that lingers here tends to drive little Genin away from this spot. Naruto shivered and tried not to give in to the impulse to rub at his skin. The air felt slimy and prickly and foul. He wanted to turn tail and get the heck out of there, but Sasuke wasn't moving so Sakura wasn't going anywhere so Naruto was stuck. Hmm, <laughs> an Uchiha, how nice, the Kusanin hissed. A girl with pink hair, amusing, but worthless. And, I suppose you would be a fool. The blonde genin flinched and glared at the mysterious Kusa genin. Jerk. There are so many Uchiha running around, the foreign ninja sighed, fixing its eyes on Sasuke. Who might you be? I'm Uchiha Sasuke, son of Fugaku and Mikato, Sasuke informed the stranger proudly. Which box does your team have? And where are your teammates? They don't seem to be around. You want to take that guy on. Naruto hissed so that only his teammates could hear. If that Kusanin is really alone and has the right box, we'd have a real advantage, Sakura reluctantly pointed out. A son of the clan head. The Kusanin said, sounding downright gleeful. 
It's always nice when something like this falls into my lap. Don't worry about boxes. Allow me to test the strength of your sherry non, if you've managed to awaken it, that is. If you don't have the box we need, we're not wasting our time with you, Sasuke declared. Let's go, he whispered to his teammates. If she pursues, use Bun's hands to lose her. I'm sorry, but you don't have a choice, the Kusanin said, suddenly on level ground less than two yards away from them. If you don't hurry up, I'll be the one to make the first move. Naruto felt all the hairs stand up on his head. Now that it was closer, he could smell the Kusanin. It smelled like death and maybe snakes barely human at all. Run, Sasuke hissed. I'll catch up. And then the Uchiha was charging the mysterious Kusanin with a kunai drawn. Sasuke. Naruto yelped. What the hell? It was hard to follow what happened next, it went down so fast. The Kusanin knocked off its broad straw hat, revealing a feminine head, but Naruto still wasn't convinced that the figure was a for sure female, as Sasuke swiftly closed the few yards that separated them. And then they collided in a lightning fast taijutsu tangle. For every punch and kick that Sasuke threw, the Kusanin either dodged or blocked. From what Naruto could see, Sasuke wasn't giving the fight his absolute all, his eyes had gone back to black instead of staying the blood red of Sherry Nan. Naruto, Sakura hissed, tugging on his sleeve. Let's go. Sasuke-kun will handle her. It doesn't look like he is, Naruto argued. And besides, if we stay we'll have numbers on our side. Teamwork, remember. But Sasuke-kun said. Naruto was already moving in, burying any misgivings or hesitation to join in the fight. The Kusanin had quickly dragged the fight up into the tree branches. It looked like Sasuke had gotten frustrated enough to crack out his Kekai Genkai again as the Uchiha was moving much faster, and even landed a punch. But then the Kusanin cranked up the pace, proving that the foreign ninja had been holding back. Naruto found a shadowy spot up in the canopy where he couldn't be spotted by the two battling genin. He hesitated for a moment before generating three Kagebun's hints. The blonde, and his copies, grinned wildly and darted in with the intent to attack from four different directions almost simultaneously. When the Kusanin did a few acrobatic flips to avoid Sasuke's kunai, Naruto rushed for its left side, and the right side, the head, and the feet, too. With fluid, almost serpentine strikes, the Kusanin destroyed the clones going for the head and right side, knocked the real Naruto down towards the ground many feet below, and slid out of the way of the last clone, causing its attack on the feet to fail. And then, while Naruto was struggling to fall in a way that wouldn't break anything when he landed, his sole remaining bunshin was nailed by the Kusanin's kunai. Solid bunshins, the Kusanin mused aloud, as Naruto caught himself on a low-growing tree branch. And no element involved in their structure, just pure chakra. A powerful fool, then. Sasuke tried to take advantage of the Kusanin's apparent distraction and pinned the other genin down with a web of wires. The Uchiha brought the ends of the wires to his mouth and breathed fire down them after a few quick hand seals. A small inferno consumed the trapped Kusanin, and Naruto gawked at the sight. Did, did Sasuke seriously kill that guy? Sasuke-kun, did you kill her? Sakura squawked. The chakra-fueled fire quickly shrank down to a few flickering flames and Sasuke moved in to examine the body. No, I didn't get her, the Uchiha called down to them. She replaced herself with a mud clone. Really? Naruto blinked. Let's get out of here before she regroups and decides to come back, Sasuke said and started to jump off the high branch he was perched on. That was a nice warm up, but I'm not done playing with you yet. The Kusanin blindsided Sasuke mid-leap and knocked the Uchiha into a massive tree trunk. Sasuke-kun. Sakura yelped. Let's see where your limits are, the foreigner cooed darkly. And then the Kusanin summoned snakes. Two giant demon snakes. One immediately slithered towards Sasuke, and the second, darted for Naruto. Yeah. The blonde yelped and dove to the ground. The snake, an immense blue-scaled beast with odd patterns on its hide, simply crashed through the branch Naruto had been sitting on as if was a twig and kept on coming. This is not cool. The blonde tore off through the trees, leading the snake away from the battle, and trying desperately to lose it. This is so not cool. 
Sakura crouched down at the base of a tree and watched as Sasuke desperately dodged both the enormous snake and the Kusa Kunoichi. A second snake had chased Naruto away. She'd almost given chase, but that would have left Sasuke alone with the snake and the person who'd summoned the snake. Even though Sasuke had the Sharingan, the Kusanin he was fighting was of a much higher level than they'd previously anticipated. She can't be a genin, the pink-haired girl thought as she watched the Kusanin perched on top of the snake's skull as the serpent herded Sasuke in sloppy circles in the trees above. The strength it would take to summon just one of those snakes. She has to at least be a chenin. What was a chenin doing in a test meant for genin? Was she a part of the test? Was she just some interloper in the forest to make trouble and sabotage the trials? What should I do? Sakura flinched as the giant serpent bit into the huge trunk of a nearby tree, narrowly missing Sasuke. What can I do? If memory serves, the Kusanin said conversationally as her snake kept trying to eat Sasuke. The head of the Uchiha clan has another son. Itachi, isn't it? Perhaps I should challenge him to get a better feel for the strength of the Uchiha these days. That goaded Sasuke into a risky attack. With a snarl the Uchiha bounded between the snake's coils and tried to stab the older Kunoichi. The dark-haired girl caught his kunai hand at the very last second and twisted the boy into a painful hold with his back pressed up against her chest. Such an impulsive child, the Kusanin purred and licked the boy's cheek with her freakishly long tongue. I wonder if I should take your beautiful eyes now or later. Sakura felt her blood turn to ice water as she watched from her hiding place. Sasuke-kun. You'll never get them. Sasuke snapped and managed to move enough to perform Mikawarimi, leaving the older Kusanin clutching a broken tree branch instead of a boy. That's what you think, the Kunoichi chuckled, and then whispered some instructions to her summon. Sakura pressed herself tighter into a recess formed by the tree's giant roots as the snake began seeking Sasuke out, tasting the air for him with its forked tongue. It slithered from branch to branch and from tree to tree as it methodically sought its prey. Apparently bored of her ride, the snake summoning Kunoichi left the serpent's head to perch on the half-buried giant skull that the Kusanin had claimed to be the Cuba no Yokos. Where did Sasuke-kun go? The girl wondered fearfully as she shivered and prayed not to be discovered. Did he think that I went after Naruto? Did he forget that I was here and run away? Does he even care? The snake hissed loudly and, with a snap of its jaws, flushed Sasuke out of a dense clump of leaves. The Uchiha boy avoided being devoured, but his wild leap brought him right into the snake's massive coils. Sasuke ended up pinned by the snake's tail and up against the base of a tree barely five yards away from where Sakura crouched. You should have run away, Sasuke-kun, the Kunoichi sighed as she watched from atop the monstrous moss-covered skull. After all that exercise, I think my pet is hungry. No. Panic stabbed at the pink-haired girl's heart as she watched the snake open its huge mouth and slither closer to the trapped, breathless boy. No. And finally she moved. Did you see the size of that spider? Ino shrilled as she clung to Chuji's arm, shivering. Yeah, Chuji nodded as he glanced nervously around, as if he expected the giant spider to have chased them. Troublesome, Shikamaru grunted and leaned against a tree. He really regretted giving in and entering into the trials with his team. He'd thought it would be less troublesome to go along with what his sensei and Ino had wanted. If he got the trials out of the way early, it would get him out of the awful deranks and would perhaps impress his mother enough that she would ease up on him a little. But now. Gah. Go away. Team 10 flinched at the shout and turned towards it. A blur of orange dashed past them on their left. Then a few seconds later the single largest snake that the Genin team had ever seen rushed after the orange blur. And then it was over, with only some crushed branches and leafy debris to prove that anything at all had happened. That was a really, really big snake, Eno whimpered quietly. Who was that? Chuji wondered, staring wide-eyed. Naruto, Shikamaru replied, blinking. He's the only one troublesome enough to wear all that orange. Sasuke wheezed feebly as the massive, powerful serpent crushed his chest with its coiled tail. He couldn't move and his vision was starting to turn gray. Very soon he would die, and the snake would eat him. I can't, I can't die here. I can't die as a, a worthless genin. I have to, I have to, I. The snake's head loomed over him with its huge maw gaping wide. 
There was a flash of something metallic. The snake's mouth snapped shut in surprise. And then. Bang. The snake's body tensed before entirely collapsing in a twitching heap. Smoke and blood seeped out of the serpent's mouth. No longer crushed against the tree trunk, Sasuke gasped for air and was left woozy from the sudden rush of blood back to his brain. Wah, what? Little girl. The Kusakunoichi hissed darkly. You killed my snake. Blinking, Sasuke dazedly looked around and spied Sakura crouched nearby, trembling and trying to glare at the Kusanin. An exploding tag, the Uchiha realized as the fog receded from his brain. She put an exploding tag on a kunai and threw it down the snake's throat. I, I won't let you turn Sasuke-kun into snake food. The pink-haired girl said, trying to sound bold. The Kusanin narrowed her eyes and tensed to strike. Sasuke took advantage of her distraction and darted in, Sherry non-spinning, and slammed his knee into the older Genin's side. Before the Kunoichi had a chance to recover, Sasuke followed up with a punch to the side of the head. He went for a third hit, but the dark-haired girl managed to lurch out of his reach. The Uchiha didn't let up. He pursued the Kusanin, intent on disabling her so that she couldn't bring his team to any more grief. He wouldn't let the foreigner go after Sakura. The pink-haired girl was too fragile to survive direct conflict with the older Kunoichi. And if Sakura was taken out, their whole team would fail. That was unacceptable. The boy upped his assault, firing off a barrage of small fireballs. While the foreign girl was busy dancing out of the way of those, Sasuke hurled several shuriken. And when the sharp throwing stars failed, the young Uchiha chased her up the tree, determined to finish things. He would not be defeated by some older genin. He would not be bested by a foreigner. He would not be beaten by a girl. As he made another reckless charge he blinked. It was like he'd been blind before. His vision was clearer, more precise his perception was so sharp that time seemed to slow down further than it ever had before. Sasuke grinned fiercely as he closed in and landed every blow he made, absolutely sure of his opponent's moves to the point of fearlessness. His sherry non was now balanced each eye possessed two tomo. I can see. With his new edge, Sasuke dominated the battle for the next minute, which was all he needed. Ricocheting off a tree branch. He caught the Kunoichi upside down and drove her head first into a lower branch. After a sickening crunch, it was done. Moments later, Sakura leapt up to perch on a nearby branch. Sasuke-kun. The girl trailed off, unsure of what to say. I suppose I should check her for a box, Sasuke muttered and edged towards the broken body. The Kunoichi's body seemed to peel away like a shed husk. A subtly different figure stood although it looked like it was slithering up and languidly turned to face the young Uchiha. Sasuke flinched at the sight of the figure's golden serpent eyes leering at him from the thing's pale purple marked face. Bravo. The thing chuckled, its voice noticeably deeper and more masculine. To advance your sherry non to the complete second level spontaneously like that, and at your young age. You have some real potential, Sasuke-kun. Who are you? Sasuke demanded warily, leaping a safe distance away from the mysterious person. I am Orochimaru, the serpentine being smiled, licking its lips with its overly long tongue. Tell me, Sasuke-kun, would you like to have real power? The snake summoner smirked as he stared down the young Uchiha. There was a flicker of interest in the boy's blood-red eyes. But then young Sasuke was back on his guard with a few shuriken in his hand, ready to continue their fight. It didn't really matter what Sasuke wanted, though. Orochimaru was here to sow the seeds of chaos. If he could acquire a sherry non or two, all well and good, if not, there were other times and other targets. Chuckling, Orochimaru reached into one of his pockets and removed a vial of dark violet fluid. Removing the stopper, he carefully inserted his right and then his left upper fang into the small glass tube. Part of his demonic heritage had gifted him with hollow fangs, like that of a venomous snake. He didn't have any venom of his own, but he could store poisons or other liquids in his fangs, which was really quite handy in these sorts of situations. I'll give you power, Sasuke-kun, the snake man smiled in wicked glee. Just hold still for one minute. Sasuke didn't hold still, of course. But that made it more fun. Even with the boy's sherry non, it wasn't too difficult to chase him around and herd him to one particular branch. 
As soon as Sasuke landed on the remains of Orochimaru's old mud clone, the rogue shinobi made a few hand seals and the mud turned into a sticky earthen glue that trapped the Uchiha's feet for a precious few seconds. Now for the fun part. Bearing his fangs, Orochimaru extended his neck, another gift of his mystery reptile demon father, and struck out at the boy in a viper-like fashion. He sank his teeth into the juncture between Sasuke's neck and shoulder and pumped the fluid along with his own chakra into the wound. The boy immediately started screaming in agony, but Orochimaru didn't detach himself until he was certain that the new curse seal was fully formed. When the rogue shinobi ended the bite, the boy tumbled off the branch and down to the ground where he continued to convulse until he lapsed into unconsciousness. Sasuke's kunoichi teammate hurried to his side and cradled his limp body, weeping a bit. Orochimaru admired his handiwork for a moment before he decided to move on. Enjoy my gift, Sasuke-kun, he laughed as he jumped off deeper into the forest. Assuming you survive it, of course. I wonder, where did that other snake of mine get to? Naruto ran until his lungs burned, desperate to get some distance between himself and the snake, if he couldn't lose the huge thing completely. He might have run past a few other teams, and he was sure that he'd run right through another squad, but no one had helped out or given chase. Perhaps the gigantic hungry snake that was trying to eat him had something to do with that. When he tripped on a branch and tumbled to the dirt, he was sure that it was the end for him, so he curled up into a ball and waited. Except no snake gobbled him up. Naruto hesitated for a moment, and then sat up and looked around. No snake. Did I, lose it? Hiss. Naruto jumped, whirled around. The snake eagerly gulped down the bite-sized shinobi. With a satisfied hiss, it started the long slither back to its summoner. Hopefully those two other genin were still around, and still on the menu. After that ridiculously long pursuit, the snake was starving, and... Being cold-blooded, the snake welcomed heat. So when its guts started to feel warm, the summon didn't mind that meant that it could digest the boy faster. But its insides quickly grew much too hot. The snake panted, and a burst of blue flame burst from its throat. Shrieking in agony, the snake struggled to regurgitate its meager meal and speedily reversed its summoning so that it could return home and hopefully recover. Naruto tumbled end over end a few times before coming to a stop up against a massive fallen log right side up. G-U-H. The half-transformed, snake slobber-drenched boy gasped, and raised his claws up into the air. I'm alive. Once he caught his breath, Naruto wobbled to his feet to wring the saliva out of his clothes and tail. Wait a minute. Naruto's fox eyes darted around warily as he took in his surroundings. Where the hell am I? Chapter 17, Nature of the Kitsune Sarutobi sat in the portrait room and reminisced. He thought back to his younger years when he would come to this room and look upon the portraits of his predecessors and wondered what they might think of him and the job that he was doing. Looking at his own portrait, taken shortly after he had first ascended to his current office, Hiruzen sighed wistfully at the sight of his brown hair and his young face, free of wrinkles and age spots. Ah, if only I were young again. When people looked at him, they judged him by his visible age and didn't quite seem to believe that he still possessed a sharp mind. With every passing year there was greater pressure for him to select a successor. And had there been any candidates that Hiruzen could have put his faith in, he would have done so already. He knew he was getting old and it was only a matter of time before he suffered a stroke or a heart attack, or his long-time tobacco habit caught up with him. Kumo is dead. Orochimaru is firmly off the list. Dan is dead. Jiraiya is more important as a spymaster, he openly flaunts his vices, and he travels too much. Tsunade doesn't seem likely to ever return. None of the clans would be comfortable with a werewolf, and the Uchiha could even revolt over it. Kakashi shows some promise, but he's years away from being as ready as his sensei. The old Hokage turned away from his own portrait and peered back through time at the images of the Hokages who had come before him. The large pictures went from color photographs, to black and white photographs, to paintings. All were men, except for one woman Aburamejo, the seventh. Over the 250 year history of the village there had been at least one Hokage from nearly every major clan, except for the Uchiha and the Hyuga. By the reign of the 10th Hokage, Nara Shikato, it fell out of favor to refer to the Hokage by his number, in Shikato-sama's words, 
The higher the number gets, the more troublesome it'll be just call me Hokage-sama please. Hiruzen's eyes settled on the oldest portrait, the oil painting of Senju Hashirama, the Shodai. He had grown and expanded the forests around the village of Kanaha with his Mokutan powers a rare type of chakra that cropped up from time to time in the bloodlines of his clan. In a time of war and chaos, he'd brought the founding clans together and planted the seeds of the current peaceful era. I wonder, a few centuries from now, how will I measure up against the Shodai in the history books? Daydreaming again, Hiruzen. The Hokage blinked and turned towards the doorway of the room to find his wife watching him. She'd been a beauty and an accomplished kunoichi in her day, but the long years had taken their toll. He didn't mind her aged face, though, it was easy for him to remember the way that she'd once looked when he gazed upon her. And he loved her, he'd gone and married her after all. Maybe, he chuckled. Is it time for lunch already? Past time, she replied, folding her arms over her chest. All right, just let me straighten a few things out on my desk and we'll go. As he was putting the various forms, reports, and scrolls into some semblance of order so that he could take an hour-long lunch with his wife, he came across a particular scroll that made him frown. Do I want to know? A new Azunin arrived today, the Hokage said as he unfurled the scroll again and checked the signatures on it. To stay? It certainly took them long enough, she snorted. It's been more than a decade since that Kushina girl left. Who is it? Bayaku Chikashoku. The old man shook his head and set the scroll back down. There's something off about him, though. Normally Uzugakuur gives some advance warning before they send one of their ninja for a long-term stay, but he just showed up unannounced. Did he have all the right papers? His wife asked. Yes, he nodded slowly, he did. Then if he bothers you so much, put him on the Umbu's watch list. I will. Sarutobi nodded and took her hand. But first, we go out to lunch. Mangetsu brushed his gloved hand over the hub of the seal network and fed fresh chakra into the magical construct, subtly altering the patterns. When he finished, he let his hand linger on the weather-beaten stone for a minute. Months ago, after he'd slain the demon centipede, the last thing he'd thought of was returning to this old cave. Shaking off the bitter nostalgia, he moved on to the interior of the small natural cavern. Hokage-sama wanted this site converted into a secret outpost for Umbu so he'd altered the seal network so that others could tap into it. Now it was time to clean out his old camp so that supplies could be stashed out of the elements. The Umbu gathered up the detritus of his old existence and sealed it away into storage scrolls for later disposal. He'd collected bits of litter, like old pop cans, and discarded odds and ends that travelers had left behind things that he'd had no use for then, and had even less use for now. The electric lantern had been a lucky find, and it could stay where it was, it only needed a little maintenance before it could be useful to future Umbu sheltering here. But the checkerboard had to go. The cardboard game board was mildew-y, discolored, and starting to warp so badly that it was hard to play on. Less than half of the black and red plastic game pieces were still present, with black rocks and reddish bottle caps substituting for most of the rest of the pieces. As Mangetsu arranged the battered game on a storage scroll to seal it away, he paused and frowned. Where's the Black Knight? He'd been lucky to find the little black horse head when he'd been scratching around the remains of a civilian campsite on the fringes of his territory. It had been a shame that he didn't have a full chess set he far preferred chess over checkers. But the lonely chess piece had served well as a black checker, and checkers was better than no game at all to play. The masked man combed the confines of the small cave, but the bit of plastic failed to turn up. He went back and counted all the other checkers and found that all the rest had been exactly where he'd left them. Puzzled, he left the cave and scoured the surrounding ravine, but again had no success. Where could it have gone? And then a thought struck him. Did, the fox creature take it? It would make sense. The strange fox creature that had sort of smelled like a wolf was the only thing that knew where he had lived before the Hokage's grandson, Kano Amaru, had stumbled over him. And the odd creature had really liked the chess piece, even though it had always played as the red pieces. Thinking of the odd fox, he thought back to the verbal report he'd given the Hokage his debriefing. Near the end, when he had mentioned the creature, the Hokage hadn't been surprised or interested in it. There had been no requests for further details or discussions on the nature of the mysterious creature. 
Sarutobi-sama had not been intrigued or worried. Why? I'll have to ask him. Mangetsu finished sealing away the checkerboard and gathered together the scrolls to leave the site behind. As soon as the lull arrives between the forest of death and the arena battles, I'll ask Hokage-sama about it. A supply cart loaded down with bags of rice paused at the gates of the demon hunting village of Whirlpool County. There was a brief switch where the cart owners temporarily handed over the horse reins to Izunin in exchange for payment. Then the gates creaked open and the cart rattled through to where the grain would be unloaded. Shortly before the cart made it to the warehouses, a small brown toad leapt out of a crevice formed between rice bags and hopped off into the village. The tiny toad bounded from shady space to decorative bush to shadow, pausing every now and then to the skin its surroundings with its bulging eyes. When it found a quiet little alleyway, it hunkered down and opened its mouth. Jiraiya stepped out of the little toad a feat only possible through advanced magic and warily glanced around. Once he was satisfied that he had penetrated the village, he scooped up the little toad and slipped it into a pocket with a little piece of candy as a reward. With his ticket out of the village secured, Jiraiya activated his favorite stealth jutsu so that he blended into his surroundings and carefully skulked around. Considering the length that the Uzunin went to to keep outsiders out, it would probably be a very bad thing for him to be caught. The streets were dusty and unpaved, but all the buildings that he could see were of fine construction. The walls were brightly colored, some covered in finely painted murals. All of the buildings had an ornate, well-crafted feel to them, that seemed out of place when contrasted with the rude roads and the rocky terrain that laid just outside of the village walls. The white-haired giant walked for about two blocks before he found a pair of older women dressed in traditional yukatas one red and one green and gossiping outside of a general store. Jiraiya grinned and tiptoed up to them to better eavesdrop on their conversation. Chatterbox women provided a wealth of information. The vast majority of it was useless, but every now and then there was a real gem. Young people, the older looking lady huffed. They don't appreciate anything. Which grandchild did what now? Her friend, who looked marginally younger, sighed. It's not just my grandchildren, it's everyone's grandchildren. The silver-haired woman declared. The ten clans agreed to name this village as Ishiagakur no Sato, not as Ugakur as Ishiagakur. So what if they shorten it a bit? The younger woman shrugged. Uzushio always sounded a bit too elaborate to me anyway. The older lady scoffed and snapped out a fan the collapsible kind favored by high-bred women in the daimyo's courts. It's disgraceful. I remember when this was just a barren stretch of land, and the name of Ishiagaku or no Sato was a promise of a grand and hopeful future. Children these days don't appreciate what an undertaking it was to found this village, and under such circumstances. Jiraiya rolled his eyes at the woman's dramatics under the cover of his jutsu. This village had been founded a few years after Kanaha. If she had been alive at the time of Uzugakur's founding, she would have been well over 200 years old. The people of Uzugakur had a reputation for living unusually long lives the Shodei's wife was said to have lived to 100 years old before returning to her homeland to die. But a lifespan of 200 years? No human could live that long. Not by purely natural means, anyway. Yes, yes, I know, the long-suffering friend muttered. Sometimes I wonder if you really do, the woman with the fan grumbled. The walls were all built by the time that you were born. Carrie Chan. You never had to run across whole countries with the knives of hunters lusting for your blood. Oh boy, a real drama queen. Still, Jiraiya paid attention. At the very least, she could provide a basis for a future character in one of his novels. Akimi-sama, Carrie sighed deeply. Please don't be this way. I may not have been forced to go on the run like you, but I remember the early days when everyone jumped at shadows, sure that any moment everything would come undone and we'd all be killed. To be born, grow up, and live under such a shadow is not much better than what you endured. What the heck? I suppose. Akimi pursed her lips and fluttered her fan in thought. Our situation has improved since those days, and that would lead to the children being so foolish and disrespectful. At least our clans haven't fallen into shame like those Uzumaki. Oh? Indeed, Carrie agreed. How spoiled that little brat must have been to think that she could get away with a dalliance with a werewolf. Disgusting. Akimi spat with a shudder. The only way she could have done worse was to copulate with stray dogs. 
Jiraiya clenched his teeth in indignation. Nasty old broads. It wasn't like he'd been consumed by the curse at the time of their intimate relations. Why couldn't my dear student enjoy a woman who loved him, in spite of it all? And that, thing, she birthed. Carrie grimaced distastefully. How she could stand it I don't know. The old Conahanin decided that he hated these old ladies. A Hanyu is bad enough in these times, Akimi muttered, but that little abomination. A Hanyu? Jiraiya went very still under his concealing chakra cloak. Half demon? But that, what? It couldn't speak when it changed, all it did was bark like a dog, Akimi continued with great disgust, it had to shift with the moon, and silver burned it like all the rest of those curse-hidden beasts. Thank goodness those foolish Uzumaki finally got rid of it. We can't have something like that tainting our bloodlines. Most certainly not, Kari nodded gravely. A rumble of thunder overhead cut short the old lady's gossip. Akimi closed her fan and retreated into the store that they'd been standing in front of. And Carrie walked off down the street, with a slate gray, bushy fox tail swishing behind her. Jiraiya stared after her, even as it began to drizzle around him, threatening his disguise. Well, shit. Kushina grimaced as she hurried through the rain to the greenhouse. Dinner had been the same old, same old, although her father had been distracted the past few nights. That wasn't really her concern, though, some hopeless suitors were supposed to be stopping by this evening and she intended to hide from them in her green sanctuary. As soon as she entered, she flipped on the overhead lamps and started squeezing water out of her hair. She really didn't have anything that needed doing, all her plants had been watered and fertilized and pruned and they wouldn't really need anything for two days at least. But perhaps the grandmotherly gardener would be around for her to chat with. Huh. She glanced around at the tables and shelves cluttered with trays and pots full of various plants, and found that she was the only person inside. Drat, alone then. I suppose she's staying inside. No sense in going out in the rain if you don't have to. After wringing out her clothes she went to her collection of gardening tools and went about cleaning them. She rubbed dust and bits of dirt off the trowels and cultivators and scrubbed bits of plant matter off her sets of shears and pruning scissors. Once they were all sparkling clean, like they'd never been used, she started putting them back in their places. A heavy hand clapped down on her shoulder and she squealed. Keep it down. Kushina went very still, and then slowly turned around. That voice belonged to Jiraiya. But he couldn't be here. No human was allowed inside, not without express permission and a lot of preparation beforehand. It had never happened in her lifetime. Yet... When she completely turned around, she saw white hair, red facial tattoos, red and green clothing, and a broad human frame Jiraiya of the sun in, without a doubt. How did you get in here? She asked, dazed. This can't be real. You have a great deal of explaining to do, Jiraiya said, his eyes cool and hard. I do. She mumbled, clutching at the table behind her to keep from sinking to the floor. Maybe, this is a genjutsu? Since I've been here, I've seen old ladies with fox tails, foxes roaming the streets that are the size of men, and children with tails playing with little fox puppies that can speak. So tell me, he folded his arms over his chest, what is going on here? What are you doing with the civilians? What are you doing dealing with Oto? I, what? Kushina blinked and tried to understand what he was talking about. Civilians. Oto? If I could venture a guess, I'd say that Uzugakuri either harbors Kitsune, or is entirely made up of Kitsune, Jiraiya said, looming over her. And you would have to be one. It's the only thing that makes sense. So what was it about Minato? Was it because he had potential to become the next Hokage? That way you and your village could have all the influence you wanted over Kanaha. She snapped. And, as she wasn't wearing her dampening crystal necklace, she went demonic on him. She snarled at Jiraiya, baring her fangs, and then her tails came out, the tips shifting into claws. Her first two tails dug into his biceps, nearly immobilizing his arms, and the next two tails clasped his legs just above the kneecaps, and her fifth and final tail clamped on his throat. She'd choke him so that he couldn't hurl any more vile accusations at her. How dare he insinuate those awful things? How dare he suggest that she only involved herself with Minato because of his potential to become the next Hokage. 
How dare he think that she'd only been using him? Of course. Even though Jiraiya was starting to suffocate, he glared at her as he struggled against her iron hold, like this was what he'd expected all along. Of course he would think that. With a strangled cry, she flung him across the greenhouse where he smashed a table and destroyed several dozen plants with his landing. What else do Shinobi know about Kitsune but the absolute worst? Kushina flopped to the dirt floor, her five tails limp and harmless now instead of clawed furry tendrils of death, and waited for him to recover and kill her. Shinobi thought that Kitsune were so evil and dangerous, they set out to kill them all. She'd been in Kanaha and had the chance to sit in on the lecture concerning the extinct Kitsune demons as a genin. With every stereotype and outright lie that she heard the Chenin instructor say, it had been harder and harder to sit still and not scream at him. As far as the shinobi world was concerned, Kitsune were devious creatures out to create chaos and deceive humanity to get whatever it was that they desired. It was what their ancestors knew from the Kyuubi no Yoko and his ilk, and since Kitsune were extinct, what did it matter if their information was right or not? I am a Kitsune, so I must be evil and conniving like all the rest. Therefore, like all the rest, I must die. In retrospect, Jiraiya should have expected her tail attack. All the surviving literature on Kitsune noted how their tails were their favorite tool for physical attack above their teeth and claws. But his appearance had caught her so off guard and he was so upset at her deception, at what her true motives had to be. Enraged by his discovery, she recovered from her shock and made no attempt to hide her demonic nature when she lashed out at him. Her tails were quick and strong and sharp for being nothing but chakra-charged fur. They darted out from behind her as quick as striking vipers so that he hadn't realized what was going on until she'd already captured him. As she'd strangled him, he dully noted the number of tails that she had and pegged her true age as somewhere around 400 years old. That made her old enough to be a survivor of the Great Hunt, and added to her motivation to plot against the shinobi world. At least I sent a messenger toad to Sensei, he thought as he struggled against her iron hold. Kanaha will know about this place. They will be warned, even if I don't make it. But as his vision started to fade from lack of oxygen, the rage the red tint to her irises abruptly vanished from her fox demon eyes, and the red-haired woman hurled him away. It took him precious minutes to catch his breath and regain his feet. Both his arms and legs had suffered minor wounds, and his throat burned from the crushing force of her fifth tail. However, Kushina made no attempt to take advantage of his weakness. She had collapsed to the ground with her limbs limp and head down. Her tails looked fluffy and harmless now with the tips of them no longer altered into claws. The only movement of her body was her breathing and the claw-like nails of her left hand as they etched lazy swirls into the dirt floor. What are you waiting for, Hentai-sama? She asked in a soft, dull voice. Hurry up and kill me. Jiraiya was startled at her words. But he had a mission to complete. Staying on the far side of the greenhouse, out of range of her tails, he went back to trying to gather information. If I killed you, I wouldn't get any answers, would I? He snorted, and then coughed. Now, what is this village doing with the civilians and making deals with Odagakur? I don't know what you're talking about, she muttered, still drawing in the dirt with her claws. I stopped caring about this place when it made me give my baby up. He narrowed his eyes at her slumped form. I don't believe you. Of course you don't, she replied. I'm a kitsune and everything that comes out of my mouth is a lie. I only speak the truth when it suits my plans. I'm a manipulator and a deceiver. Everything I do is for some evil purpose, isn't that right? Jiraiya frowned. That's what the history books tell us. I know what you must think, she said. I know it's pointless to change your mind. So I won't bother. But, she hesitated for a moment and finally glanced up at him, studying him with inhuman eyes. But if I could have a last request. He stared back at her and weighed the risk of agreeing, because if he made a promise his personal honor code demanded that he keep it. Find Naruto, she pleaded. Everyone hated him here, or pretended that he didn't exist. He didn't have any friends. I, I had to give him up. Her fox eyes turned glassy and her voice grew thick. I had to give him up, if he stayed someone would have probably killed him. I couldn't get my father agree to send him to Kanaha, or to you, but anything was better than here. 
She brushed some of her long red hair from her face and revealed that her ears had gone a bit pointed. You couldn't leave with him. No, of course not, she sneered bitterly. I'm a woman. I'm needed here to make more little baby Kitsune. She let out a sharp bark of humorless laughter. Not that I've made any pure-blooded fox babies. I never will, just to spite them all. So you want me to go find Naruto? Jiraiya said slowly, shifting to try and ease the throbbing of his injuries. Yes, Kushina nodded eagerly. You promised Minato that you'd be Naruto's godfather, didn't you? So you really wouldn't be doing it for me, you'd be doing it for him. And Naruto's a Hanyu, so he's not all bad, he's a good boy, he won't turn out like Orochimaru. She was desperate now, which Jiraiya found unnerving. The Uzumaki Kushina that he'd been familiar with had never been desperate, not like this. He's a good boy, he's Minato's boy. You'll find him and look after him, won't you? Won't you? She was begging him, on her knees, with her hands clasped in front of her chest. She still looked very human, just with elongated canines, claw-like fingernails, elfin ears, and fox-like eyes. Her fluffy fox tails half blended in with her long red hair being the same color except for the white tips and almost looked like bizarre hair extensions. Her desperation seemed genuine. Everything about her seemed genuine. But could he trust that? Was it all an act? Did Minato know about you? He asked, his hand straying towards where he had stashed the photograph. No, she said softly, her eyes falling to the dirt. No one outside the village can find out. And, he was a human, trying to hold on to his humanity, and sworn to defend humankind from inhuman things. How could he love me if he knew that I'd never been human, and never would be? How could he love me if he knew that I was an animal? Jiraiya grimaced and slipped the picture from his pocket. What is going on here? He turned and did a bit of a double take. For a moment he thought the woman standing at the greenhouse doorway was Tsunade. But this woman was much older and didn't appear to do anything to disguise her age the way that Tsunade would. It was the diamond-shaped chakra seal on her forehead and the authoritative air around her that confused him. Who are you? The old woman with her gray hair done up in buns demanded focusing her steely gray eyes on Jiraiya. I don't know you. Goodness, what happened to the flowers? Jiraiya glanced over his shoulder and belatedly realized that his rough landing had smashed a table loaded with potted plants. Oops. He is Jiraiya of the Densetsu no Sunin, Kushina told the old woman. I told you about him, didn't I? Ah yes, the super pervert who likes to peek into the women's baths, the old lady frowned slightly. And then she gave a start. How did you get in here? Village security wouldn't let in your bleeding. The old woman in her dusty, faded yukata strode over to him and started fussing over the tears and dark stains on his clothing where Kushina had injured him. Kushina-chan, you clean up those poor plants and I'll take care of him. The white-haired man almost expected to be attacked. He wasn't supposed to be in this village. In order to protect the secret of the Kitsune's presence, it made perfect sense to eliminate him. But the old woman touched him with green glowing hands healing chakra and tended his wounds instead. As she healed the shallow punctures on his upper arms and legs, Kushina told the woman of what had gone on in the greenhouse. She didn't get very far. When the redhead reached the part where he accused her of trying to use Minato for nefarious purposes, the old woman stopped healing him, whipped out a folded up fan, and cracked him over the head with it. Repeatedly. Shame on you. She scolded. You deserve whatever she did to you. Shame on you. Bachan, he didn't know any better, Kushin aside. You know what they think of us. As far as he knows, his assumptions were completely reasonable. That's no excuse for being so horribly rude. The old woman huffed and gave him one final smack for good measure. And it's not like there hasn't been a Hokage with a fox wife before. What? Jiraiya squawked. When? Kushina asked. Oh long before you were born, Kushina-chan, the old lady sighed and snapped open her fan to stir the still air of the greenhouse. Kanaha wasn't around 400 years ago, Jiraiya thought with a frown, and surreptitiously counted the redhead's tails again. None of the hidden villages were around 400 years ago. So, the number of tails a kitsune has has nothing to do with age. He asked hesitantly. 
Of course not, the granny replied. I don't know where humanity got the silly idea that it takes a century for a kitsune to sprout a new tail. I bet some egomaniac wanted to make himself seem more important and made it up, Kushina grunted as she started piling up the plant bits that couldn't be saved. Hmm. The old woman put her fan away and walked around to heal his other side, but paused when she noticed the picture in his hand. What's this? Something for Kushina, he answered. Eh. The redhead stopped her cleanup efforts at her name. What's for me? Jiraiya handed her the instant photo. She blinked, and then stared at it with great intensity. Her hands trembled, her lower lip trembled, and a few tears leaked from the corners of her eyes. Kushina-chan. The old woman murmured worriedly. I, I'm so happy. She sniffled and tenderly traced the tip of a claw over Naruto's image. Minato, he'd be happy, too. He'd be so proud. While Kushina showed off the picture to her older companion, Jiraiya watched and sighed. Of all the possibilities he'd imagined before entering this village, uncovering long-hidden kitsune was not one of them. Now he wasn't sure if he should believe what his ancestors knew of the fox demons, or what the fox demons themselves said. What is the true nature of the kitsune? He just didn't know. Chapter 18, Don't Feed the Animals When Kiba smelled that bizarre smell, like a curious puppy, he just had to find out its source. Giving the excuse that he had to go pee, Kiba and Akamaru slipped away from the rest of Team 8 to see what was making the funky odor. The Inuzuka boy wrinkled his nose as he followed the trail of the fetid, oily smell through the giant-sized forest of death towards its source. It's pretty strong so the source can't be too far. And then a patch of vegetation rustled slightly just up ahead, bringing boy and puppy to a halt. Akamaru, Kiba whispered, sneak around behind it for an ambush. Right. Akamaru woofed softly and the fluffy white and brown puppy trotted off into the trees to approach the suspicious spot on the other side. After giving his little dog a few minutes to get into position, Kiba slowly moved forward again, all of his unusually sharp senses on high alert. The closer he slunk to the patch of tangled weeds and undergrowth, the heavier the oily smell became. Then, when he was close enough, he cautiously reached out a hand and started to move the leaves out of the way. The leaves exploded and something black rushed at his face. The next thing that Kiba knew, he was on his back with Akamaru worriedly licking at his face. Kiba. Kiba wake up. G-U-H, Kiba grunted, grimacing at the absolutely foul taste he found in his mouth. I'm up, I'm up, what the heck. Something jumped out of the bushes at you and you yelped, but I didn't see where it went. Kiba sat up and rubbed at his face to remove Akamaru's slobber. Can you smell where it went? No, the puppy whined, ashamed. Well. It does not appear that you are visiting the little boy's tree, as you said you were, Shino said from his spot leaned up against the base of a nearby tree. I was coming back and I tripped. Kiba snapped as he wobbled to his feet and hefted Akamaru up towards his shoulder. Your breath smells funny, the puppy complained as he hopped from Kiba's shoulder to the boy's head. Your breath smells worse, Kiba quietly retaliated as he stumbled towards his team. K Kiba kun. Hinata stuttered softly as she fidgeted in Shino's shadow. A-A-R-U-L-A-L-R-I. I'm fine, the Inuzuka grunted, even though his stomach felt a bit queasy and sloshy, like he'd eaten something nasty. Let's just go get that other damn box so we can be done. Black. Kiba grunted and rubbed at his stomach as he followed Shino and Hinata back towards their original path. I think I need some antacids. Kashoka lounged at an outdoor table of a cheap cafe and nibbled disinterestedly on a sandwich. He hadn't done much in Kanaha yet, just settled into a cheap apartment set up for him and got a feel for the village's layout. In a few more days, he felt he could start approaching certain individuals and planting seeds. A pale-haired Otonin with some red facial markings smoothly settled into the seat across the small table from him and Kashoka frowned slightly. I'm acting as the Jonin sensei for the Oto Genin entered into the trials, the Otonin said as a way of introducing himself. Oto's leader wanted me to meet with you and give you information on our top source in this village. Sars. Kashoku asked in a bland voice. Once the test in the forest of death is complete, look up the Kanaha Genin Yakushi Kabuto, the Otonin advised him. Every year he enters the trials, but he never makes it past the forest of death. 
He's gathered a lot of information, which you might find useful. Being a native of this village, he's very well acquainted with its subtleties. Interesting, Kashoka smirked faintly. Will he be expecting me? Yes, the Otonin nodded slightly. Just ask him about snake bite cures he officially studies medicine and he'll know that you are to be assisted. Excellent, Kashoka smirked a bit wider. Convey my deep gratitude to your leader for his generosity. I shall do my best to play my part in return. The Otonin smiled briefly and left the table before a server could notice him and ask him if he wished to make an order. It was nice meeting with you. Enjoy your sandwich. I will, Kashoka replied, and it was nice meeting you, too. This is perfect, the Ozunin laughed in his own mind as he took another bite of his lunch. This is much better than I had hoped for. Ruining this village will be almost too easy. Sakura sniffled as she vainly fussed over Sasuke's prone form. She'd been able to drag him into a cavern formed by the massive roots and half-hollowed interior of one of the Forest of Death's oversized trees. Sasuke was heavy, though, so she hadn't been able to go far from the eerie, mostly buried, giant kitsune skeleton. It's so creepy here, she thought as she rubbed at her arms. It's not cold, but I still have goosebumps. Sasuke-kun, please get better soon. The Uchiha boy had been unconscious since the fight yesterday and showed no signs of waking soon. His skin was like fire when she touched it. His breathing went through cycles of being deep and slow to being short and shallow. She couldn't decide if he was trying to wake sometimes, or just suffering nightmares. Oh please wake up Sasuke-kun. She rubbed furiously at her green eyes, trying to drive away the tears that threatened to obscure her vision. Don't leave me alone. So far. In her short career, Sasuke, Kakashi-sensei, or even Naruto had always been around to protect her. She'd never had to do anything completely on her own before. There had always been someone else nearby that would help, someone stronger. A sound something rustling made her flinch. Her eyes darted towards the opening of the little chamber, seeking the cause. She'd laid a few simple traps as protection for their hidden campsite, but would it be enough? Had some other team avoided the trip wires and explosive tags and a little brown squirrel bounded through the clearing just beyond the chamber mouth, paused briefly to groom its whiskers, and then darted out of sight, rustling some weeds as it vanished. A squirrel. Sakura sighed and almost collapsed as the tension left her muscles. It was just a squirrel. She wanted to cry again. What if Sasuke didn't get better? What if Naruto wasn't able to find them? How was she going to last four more days out here, alone? What if Sasuke died? That fear broke her down for a moment, and she sobbed quietly. If he died, how could she get to be his friend? If he died, how could she get acknowledgement from him? If he died, how could she become worthy of more than his sneer and his whisper of annoying? I can't cry. She rubbed at her watering eyes so hard that spots started dancing in them. I'm the only one here, I can't cry. I have to. Hold it together, Shan Nero. Sakura choked back any more sobs and shook her head vigorously. Inner Sakura straddled the line between being an imaginary friend and a voice in her head. The mental construct reflected her rawest desires and was tough and strong in all the ways that the real Sakura wasn't. The real girl sometimes wished that she could be more like her inner, but inner Sakura was just too brash and crude and no one least of all Sasuke would want to be around a girl like that so it remained an unrealized fantasy. Hold down the fort until that orange-wearing Baka comes back. Inner Sakura ranted. And while you're waiting, nurse Sasuke-kun so that he'll fall in love with us and... Sakura pinched herself and locked Inner Sakura back in the little mental box where the crazy girl spent most of her time. She needed to focus. She needed to take care of Sasuke to the best of her ability until he was well, or until time ran out and the proctors came to find them. She had to keep things together until Naruto found his way back. Because, even though Naruto was a hopeless dork, there was no way that that giant snake had managed to devour him, right? Right? The first thing that Naruto had done after escaping from the giant snake had been to get rid of the tail that he'd unconsciously sprouted in his haste to change enough to generate the blue fire. If any of the other genin in the test saw that, he'd be in a lot of trouble. He'd almost brought his appearance back to full human but he'd hesitated and then decided to stay minimally shifted. 
So long as he kept his distance from other teams until he found Sasuke and Sakura again, no one would notice his fangs or demon eyes or claws, and he would be able to use the blue fire. For the rest of the afternoon Naruto had tried to find the rest of his team. With all the crazy fleeing that he'd done from the snake, he was thoroughly lost. He tried to follow the trail of the snake, but then he'd get too close to some other team or some supersized animal would come after him. In trying to avoid detection or being eaten, he'd lose the trail and get even more lost. And then it had gotten so dark after the sun had set that he ended up finding a hollow chamber halfway up one of the giant trees and sleeping in it until morning. Now he was really, really hungry, and still really, really lost. The blonde boy groaned as he perched on a tree branch and glanced around, wary for friend or foe. His empty stomach groaned back at him and Naruto wilted a little bit more. I really hate this trial. The breeze shifted and a hint of flowery scent made Naruto's nose twitch. With how lost he already was, it didn't seem all that risky to investigate it. So he slunk along the branch, carefully sniffing and making sure to stick to leafy areas to hide his orange, eye-catching clothes from sight. It took a few leaps to other trees, but he found the source of the scent. It was perfume. Some silly Kunoichi was wearing perfume. She was a few years older, carefully made up despite being out in the forest of death, and foreign talking and if he was identifying the symbol on her he tie it right. What a crazy girl, Naruto frowned from his camouflaged vantage point up in the trees. Perfume gives you away. It smells so much stronger than plain old flowers. Even dumb demons could tell the difference, I bet. Hissa. One of the Konoichi's male teammates whined. Stop spraying that stuff. What if some dangerous animal catches wind of it? I refuse to smell like a heathen. The brunette retorted, but put away her little perfume bottle. What if I come across a cute boy while we're in here? Is that all you think about? Her second teammate groaned. I can't believe you. The first groused. Stop complaining, Hissa grumbled as she fidgeted with her hair, trying to brush it with her fingers. There's nothing wrong with looking good or smelling good. And we're almost done, anyway. We just have to find a team with a black box so that we can swap it out for our extra white box and get back to civilization, and hot showers. Girls. The first boy muttered, disgusted. You have ten minutes, the second boy decided. Then we have to get moving again. Okay, Taro. The girl chirped and started filing one of her nails. Naruto sort of felt bad for the two Taki Shinobi. Their female teammate seemed pretty useless. Sakura would never stop to spray on perfume and file her nails in the middle of dangerous territory. She wouldn't use makeup, period, she didn't need any. And then a little songbird fluttered onto the scene. The kunoichi took one look at it and stopped filing her nails to squeal in delight. She immediately pulled out a dry rice cake and offered crumbled pieces to the small bird in hopes of coaxing it closer. Hey, stop wasting your rations. The first boy hissed. They're my rations, I can do what I want with them, Hissa retorted. Don't you worry, I won't be asking for any of yours. You'd better not, Taro grunted. Naruto stared as the girl used the rice cake to feed the bird. Even though it was just a bland little rice cake, he drooled a bit. He was so hungry. And then he got an idea. It was probably a really stupid idea. But neither Sakura nor Sasuke was around to talk him out of it. So he went for it. Gotta hurry, I've got less than ten minutes before they leave. Hissa pouted when a sudden sound startled the bird away. She loved little feathery or furry animals almost as much as she loved shopping and flirting with handsome boys. If only the tiny bird had stayed longer. Even though she was a genin of Takigaku or no Sato and working towards being a chunin, she despised being a ninja. She'd never had any desire to hunt and slay demons or take down criminals. But it was an important family tradition and regrettably she'd been born with strong chakra potential so she'd become a kunoichi. Once I become a chunin, mom and dad will ease up, she thought as she nibbled on part of her rice cake. Then I can apply to be a teacher, or part of village security, so that I don't have to go out in the field where there aren't any showers or soft beds. Then everybody should be happy, so I'll be free to do more of what I want. And then another animal peered around a tree trunk at her. At first, all she saw was its head. It was mostly yellow, 
with white fur on its chin and throat, black triangular ears, black stripes on its cheeks, and it had bright blue eyes. A dog? was her first thought. Then it cautiously crept into full view, revealing its body. Its paws and part of its forelegs were black, with white on its belly and yellow on its back. It had a bushy yellow tail with a white tip that twitched nervously as it sniffed loudly at the air. A fox. It was the largest and most striking fox that she'd ever seen. Hissa swallowed a squeal so that she wouldn't scare it away and broke off another chunk of rice cake. She wanted the adorable creature to come closer. Hello there, she cooed and held out the rice cake bit towards the animal. You're so cute. Why don't you come closer? The large yellow fox sniffed the air more and licked its jaws at the sight of her rice cake. It hesitated a few moments more before slinking closer. The animal paused an inch shy of the morsel of food, and then licked it from her fingertips, retreating a few steps as it chomped on the crunchy fragment. That's it. That's a good boy. Hissa smiled and offered another little piece. Come a little closer now, a little closer. After a few more rice cake crumbs, she had the yellow fox almost in her lap. Up close, she could see that the fur along its spine was several shades darker than the rest, and it almost looked like a pale orange. And, while she distracted it with the rest of the rice cake, she found that its fur was just as fluffy and soft as it had looked for a distance. Hissa. Taro hissed. Should you be petting that thing? What if it has rabies or something? If it had rabies, it would have tried to bite me already, Hissa scoffed. You're a nice, good boy, aren't you? She cooed to the dog-sized fox as she rubbed it behind its large ears. Time's running out, Shin warned her, tapping his wristwatch. Three minutes before we move on. Darn, Hissa huffed and shifted her position to keep the foot that she was sitting on from falling asleep. Maybe you could come with us, Foxy. You're much nicer company than these two jerks. No, it can't, Shin grunted. Hissa stuck her tongue out at the two boys as she scratched the fox under its chin. Don't listen to them, she pouted. Maybe, maybe you could help us, Foxy. Hissa pulled the box with the white circle painted on it from her light pack and showed it to the furry creature. You see this? We're looking for a team that has one just like this, except the dot is black. We thought we found a team that had one yesterday evening, but after we kicked their butts it turned out that they had another white one. We took it anyway, though. She sighed. If only we could be done with two white boxes. Quit talking to that thing, Taro complained. And put that box away. Why do you guys have to be so bossy? Hissa whined. Because. Surrender your box, or else. Hissa flinched at the loud shout and she and her teammates immediately looked up. A younger Kanaha Jenin was perched up in the branches, glaring down at them with a kunai in his hand. The boy had bright blonde hair, and bright orange clothes. Is he for real? Make us, loser. Taro sneered and flung a trio of shuriken at the little moron. The Kanaha boy ducked the sharp spinning projectiles and then made a suicidal leap down at them. Your box is mine. Taro, who had their original white box immediately pulled back to protect it. Hissa also lurched away from the attack to protect their spare box and started weaving a genjutsu to hit the kid with if he somehow survived Shin. And Shin jumped at their younger, and clearly stupider, attacker with a long combat knife in each hand. The Kanaha brat really didn't stand a chance. Shin caught him in midair where the kid couldn't significantly change his trajectory and sliced the little idiot along one leg and one arm. The blonde dork gasped. Poof. The kid vanished in a cloud of white smoke. Kawarimi. Shin wondered, although no rock or fallen log appeared to replace him. Hisa and her teammates immediately shifted into a defensive formation with their backs to each other, both as mutual protection and as a way to watch for potential attacks from the dork in orange. Several tense minutes went by without any other sound but their tense breaths and pounding hearts. In the brief burst of chaos the fox creature had been scared off, and that made Hissa sad, but completing the trials and achieving Chunin was more important. Does anybody see him? Taro almost whispered. No, Hissa muttered. I don't either, Shin answered. It doesn't seem like he's going to come back. Heh, maybe he grew a brain and realized that he can't stand up to the three of us, eh? Taro snickered. Whatever, 
Let's just get going, Shin said. We need to move on anyway. Right, Taro agreed and shoved his knives into their sheaths. Hisa sighed and checked over her things to make sure she hadn't put anything down. Where's the box? Her eyes widened and she frantically searched the ground where she'd been sitting. I must have dropped it when that doofus showed up, but, where is it? Boxes don't just get up and walk away. Hissa, what's wrong now? Taro asked. The the spare box, she gulped. I can't find it. What? Taro squawked. Where did you drop it? Shin demanded. She pointed out the area and when all three of them failed to locate it, Shin suggested that she check her pack and weapons pouch. The box wasn't in either bag. And worse, she found that her entire stash of rice cakes was missing, too. It must have been that Kanaha Jenin, Shin decided after some thought. That's why he didn't come back, he got what he needed. Damn it. Hissa sniffled angrily, trying not to cry. How did that orange idiot rob me? Naruto darted through the undergrowth, pausing only to snatch up his clothes from the spot that he'd stashed them. It was really awkward to run with his arms full of clothing and his stolen loot, and he tripped over his tail a few times, but the Takinan hadn't caught on and no one chased him down. When he spied a good-looking clump of bushes several minutes away from the waterfall Genin, he dove into them to revert to his human form and put his clothes back on. I am a genius. He cackled softly to himself as he shrugged his coat back on while chewing on a crunchy stolen rice cake. An evil genius. Rice cake never tasted so good. It had been so easy. All he'd had to do was make a kage bunshin, get all furry, take advantage of the Kunoichi's love of critters, and then steal the box and rice cakes when his bunshin created a distraction. He couldn't wait to brag about his exploits to Sasuke and Sakura. I can't tell the truth, though, he thought with a frown. So, so I say that I made two kage bunshin and had one transform into an animal while the other was the distraction. Yeah. I'll say it was a squirrel, no, that's too small. Oh, a monkey. I'll say it was a monkey. Yeah. That's it. Naruto giggled and shoved the box and handkerchief bundle of rice cakes inside his coat and zipping it up. Sakura-chan will be so impressed, and that bastard will be so jealous. Immensely pleased with himself, Naruto stuck his head out of the bushes and looked around, and frowned. Damn it, I'm still lost. That's it for part 6. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.